Okay, thank you, Sayyidna. Um, so if any of you have questions, you can feel free to send them to this number over here. Um, we will be having a Q&A session um, after Father Gregory's talk. Um, but if you'd like to take a picture of this slide um, and send in any questions that you may have. So now a short introduction on um, Father Gregory Bichet. So Father Gregory Bichet was born in Cairo on May 24th, 1966. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Ayn Shams University in Cairo, Egypt in 1988. He also has a Master's and PhD in Computer Engineering from Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee in 1997. He worked in computers and electrical engineering and founded a video streaming company in the U.S. He served at St. George Church in Heliopolis, Egypt. He moved to Nashville and served at St. Mina Church in Nashville, Tennessee, and St. Marina Church in Irvine. On May 27, 2001, His Eminence Metropolitan Serapion ordained him presbyter to St. Marina in the Three Holy Youth Church, which is the Coptic Orthodox Christian Center in the city of Orange, California. So now I would like to welcome Father Gregory Boucher to the stage. It's great to be in a scientific environment. Um, and the goal of our, of our talk tonight is really um, to engage one another in a presentation that is valuable for all of us to know about in a scientific realm. Um, the offering here is not uh, as a religious statement, but rather as a depiction of facts and you decide for yourself whether the facts are enough to convince the document that's being presented. The document is basically a piece of cloth. And we're presenting here as natural and as neutral, excuse me, as possible without being biased. But we have to present very clear facts in order as a scientific community to judge. And that's important for us in this country. The beautiful thing about the United States is that we don't take things for granted. And it pushes us as, as people of faith that um, we don't have blind faith. In fact, the beautiful thing about Christianity is that we don't just take things for granted. Faith does not oppose reason, as His Eminence explained to us right now. So this is an example or a case study for the scientific community of a piece of cloth, and the piece of cloth is important for Christians not to prove the resurrection because the proof of the resurrection is from the behavior of the Christian and the lack of fear of death and the eternity more than the piece of cloth. However, for the scientific community, because we have to speak their language, I believe that God has left us with this, and the media and the, and, 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 and the opposers has tried to display challenges to it, which I will present tonight, and you judge for yourself whether these challenges are valid or not. So it's basically for your decision at the end as presenting a case, and if anybody says, sees a weakness in presenting that case, please bring it to me as soon as possible, because I believe very much that this is an open debate and an open discussion, and presenting it as if we're presenting a paper to an audience, and the audience decide whether the paper hits at home or not. The Turin Shroud, mainly for the scientific community, because as we said, as Christians, we believe in Christ and the resurrection because, by, by the behavior of our Christianity. Let me just...
It's opening this way. So as an approach, you create a hypothesis that this is the shout of a man that has been subjected to some beating and scourging and lancing and piercing. You present the hypothesis and you present the oppositions to it. What is it? It's a linen sheath um, of a, a certain type of weave. It's called herring bone, herring bone weave, and this is the dimensions of it with a front and a back image of a human. The account of the gospel for it um, is here, as mentioned um, in St. Mark chapter 27 and St. Matthew chapter 27, St. Mark 15, St. Luke 23, and St. John 19. And it's mentioned that they have been wrapped after he's been taken down from the cross. This is how a sepulcher looks like at that time. I'm going to go into some slides quickly just because of the presentation of the case will take some uh, time. It's a mystery that mankind has been trying to uncover for almost 2,000 years. Um, I use a lot a sequence of clips from a movie that has been by the History Channel, but there's going to be some other material in it as we go along. The Shroud of Turin is a 14-foot-long linen cloth. It's three and a half feet wide. It's made out of flax. It is made out of a very distinctive weave, which is called a three-to-one herringbone pattern weave. Actually, it's very similar to the pattern that you see on a pair of blue jeans. There's actual holes in the shroud. There are burn marks on it. There was a fire in 1532 that nearly destroyed the shroud. It burnt holes through the cloth, and actually those are more prominently visible on the shroud than the image itself. Let's, uh, in order to get it um, in motion, this is the trip of the shroud from Jerusalem to Edessa, Constantinople, to Lyrie, to Chambry, and then at the end to Turin. Uh, we'll present this briefly because we want to get into the presentation of the facts for you to judge the authenticity. In 544 at Edessa, 944 to in Constantinople, 1147 it was venerated at Constantinople, and then 1204 the Crusaders had witnessed they have seen it there. This is an icon for portraying it in, that it appeared in Edessa in 544 AD. And then this is a shout in 1353, the shout appears in Lurie, France, possession of a certain Geoffrey de Charny, and then it was kept in a niche cut in the wall in the altar of Saint-Chapelle uh, Church in Chambry. And then this is a key thing, the fire that left certain marks on the shout. These are the marks that are on the shroud, these U-shaped marks, and they are more prominent than the shroud itself. Here is a close-up for it. That's in, the, in a fire that happened, as we said, in 1532 uh, in Chambry. So, recap quickly, here is the pass of it, and the last step before Turin is where the fire happened in 1532, and left this in order to fix it. We had to put this U-shaped uh, pieces on it so that the shroud does not tear and become damaged. And then more um, of the extension of it, how it went to, uh, to Turin, is because Duke Emmanuel Philibert moved it to Turin because there's a certain bishop that wanted to, uh, Charles de Borromeo, uh, wanted to, uh, after the plague, to visit the shroud. So instead of walking from Milan to Chambry, he's walking from Milan to Turin. So he brought it south more to be closer to Milan. This is um, the Cathedral of St. John, as we'll see here, is where the shroud is kept currently in Turin. And this big um, monument at the back, which we see it in the lower image, is under it, the shroud is kept. Here it is, immediately above it is this uh, building that you can see, and the shroud is kept in a very golden ornamented altar there, and people would sit in front of, of it and watch it. In 1898, there was exposition of the shroud, it marked civil and religious celebration, and House of Savoy that owned the shroud photography was really new at that time, so they decided that somebody 
um, a lawyer called Secondo Pia can come and take a picture of the shout. And this is the exposition images, and here is the one in the, in the side there showing that there is now a um, manifestation of the shout for the public in 1898. Uh, here is the people sitting watching the show. Then now things get very, very interesting. That lawyer has this big box, which is a camera, believe it or not, uh, devotee of the new art of photography. Um, we came a long way, right? This is uh, probably one pixel. <laughs> so he takes a picture of it, and here is a clip that explains uh, what happened. Uh, he sits in front of it, takes a picture, and this is explanation for what happens, and I'll explain it shortly. Palace, 1898. He put his piece of glass in that was coated with a photographic emulsion. Took a picture. Took it back to his dark room. And he has this negative plate submerged in the developer solution. And as he pulls the negative plate out of the developer solution, he sees for the first time an image that nobody else has ever seen. He was astounded. The story goes that he was so astounded he almost dropped the piece of glass. The image, for some reason, was so much more lifelike, so much more realistic, so much more clarity than what you see on the shot itself. Being the religious man that he was, he said he was looking into the face of the Lord. So his image, his photo negative of the image, is what spread around the world and really uh, lit the fire of shroud uh, devotion. So what happened here, this photographer, an event happened, he, during the exposition, he got his camera and he took a picture, a picture of the shroud. The picture of any camera, you, you, you see a negative. So remember the film times, when you get the film, you get this side that looks, that's a negative on the left side. You don't get the positive. And then you go and develop the negative in order to get the reprints. So supposedly with the, em, the, the glass that's coated with the emulsion, he should get a negative picture. What did he get? A positive picture, which means that the image of the shout is what? So this number one phenomenon. The image on the shroud is a negative. Nobody paints in reverse. Nobody, if it's a painting, we're gonna prove now that it's not a painting, but the first phenomenon about the image of the shroud, it's what? Reversed. It's the opposite. Are you getting the idea? There's two more characteristics that are coming, but this is number one of them. I'm moving a little bit hastily because there is lots of things I want to get across and we'll keep moving. So this is basically um, explaining it again. Religious believers and scientists alike were suddenly caught up in the mystery. How is it possible that the shroud image is a negative image on the cloth because what appears in a photo negative is actually a positive image? Okay. So this created the frenzy and opened the topic of research, which is in 1978 um, by under um, a PhD person called John Jackson. In fact, he lives in Colorado. Um, he's the one who headed the research. We'll get into this very soon. But these are the lines that are now, um, this has caused. And this is the shout. This is the exposition for it, for research. And this is the donation of the shout from the House of Savoy, which is the one on the right, to the Catholic Church, because it was ownership of the House of Savoy. And now we get quickly into the medical, the pollen, and the image print, imprint. As I said, as I'm presenting to a scientific community, I'll focus on the last one because this is my field of expertise, imaging, and I, this is, hits at home very much for me. But for the sake of co completion, I'll just make, briefly do the medical. The pollen will be just one slide. So let's get into the medical really quick. Um, here is the, uh, the shroud being done research on in 1978. Um, so let's see what it reveals. It bears an image on it, ventral, front and back, dorsal, of a human figure. The image on the Shroud of Turin is certainly consistent with 
what we know was a Roman crucifixion. That figure has been beaten, tortured, scourged, speared in the sides. He is apparently crucified. He has an obvious wound through one of the wrists. But you can't see the other one because they're, they're on top of each other like this. There are no thumbs visible, just four fingers on each hand. And the exit wound is basically near the wrist, which is actually forensically perfect. The left foot is planted firmly against the cloth with the image of the right heel, almost like one foot was placed on the other. There is a wound in the side, which is, if you look at the biblical tradition, that is where Jesus was lanced on the cross would be in about that place. Then there's blood flowing down from that wound. The body itself is covered with scourge marks from a Roman flagrum, approximately 120 of them. The back image shows a remarkably very clear a pattern of blood stains all over the top of the head, the back of the head, from the crown of thorns. When you're looking at the face, you can see that, that, that one of the eyes seems to be a little closed. Both cheekbones swollen, one more than the other. The nose may be a little crooked, although it's not broken. There's a lot of blood around the face. Blood on the forehead, blood in the beard, blood in the hair. It's almost like an autopsy, but an autopsy of a man who suffered unbelievably. It is a remarkable, remarkable image. So we're presenting here a document on a piece of cloth that manifests that the person was scorched, the person had crown of thorns, the person was lanced on the side, the person was pierced in the hand, the person was pierced in the leg. And we're saying here is another document called the Gospels that mentions these things. So let us open our eyes and see if the comparison conclude um, that this is wrapping the body of Christ because we're going to do a probability exp exercise at the end and we'll see what happens. So let's get um, in it a little bit. So in the forehead, you can see the blood. In fact, this, this blood have an angle between them because on the cross for Christ to rest his head and to get some relaxation, some change of position, it caused the blood to fall into different directions based on the gravity. And there's an angle between them that exactly tells you how the head of Christ was in the two positions. I will not spend too much time on the medical. It's a, in itself. A, an amazing, amazing study that you can recreate what happened. This is not cadaveric blood because the blood is really on the cloth. So it has been analyzed and there's papers published on the blood. I'm gonna mention the titles of the papers very soon. Here it is in the positive and you can tell the blood is flowing. Uh, arterial as well, venal blood. The man who suffered this pain was still alive. The blood was flowing, it was not cadaveric. It was not just stopping, it was not coagulating. It was not viscous, it was flowing blood. The wound in the chest, as you can tell here, that's described by the picture um, uh, right there, that see a, a big gathering of blood in this area that matches very much what we see, the place of the lancing or the piercing. And uh, the place of excessive blood at this area, and John Jackson said, I have tried with cadavers to hang them on, um, on in position with the blood, with the nail being in the hand, and the, the nail could not withstand the weight, and it would open the hand and go through it. Many of the icons might be saying it's drawn this way because there was not analysis of the shroud, and the, icon, the, the psalm says he pierced, he pierced his hand. So the devotees or the theologian would draw it to be in the hand, but forensically it would not withstand the body, and it would be more in the wrist. At the end, I will show you manuscripts that suggest this as well that defends the, 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 the shout. So we can see here that the, um, this goes through here. What did this do? It did the following. It's called the space of the shtot, natural gap between the bones allowing for easy insertion of a nail, and the Romans are very experts at this. It causes a damage to the median nerve where the sensory and motor information are flowing. It causes muscle contraction, which causes the closing of the thumb, and hence you see what? Four fingers. Did you notice that? It's not five. So this is the forensic explanation for this. The thumb doesn't appear on the shroud. Very clear, it doesn't appear. The head, uh, this is looking now on the dorsal image. The head, it, it suggests that the crown of thorns was probably a hat of thorns. And you see many lacerations here, either because of the cross or also because of the flogging. 
In fact, there is calculation of exactly, you can get the angle of the person who was flogging Christ by the shape of the wounds here. It would leave marks that if you do an extension line through them, it would intersect at a point that would tell you exactly where the person was flogging Christ, and they would change position. In fact, they would say that one was shorter than the other from how these wounds landed. Deeply embedded thorns in the back of the head cause a damage. Um, we have a damage, a branch of occipital artery. And I will not get into the medical. You're more, or people of you who study medicine are more familiar with it. That's not my field, but at least presented to you as a continuation or a completion for the research. Here is papers published about the blood or the scourges. Um, the, the author here says, I must add only those lashes producing an excoriation or a contusion have left their mark. In all, I have counted more than 100 of these perhaps 120 very reputable uh, people publishing the results after the research on the Shroud of Turin. It suggests very much that the shape of the flogging because of the, the things that it sees, leaves as a mark on the back of the person that was being um, flogged, it suggests that this was uh, metal pieces that has two bones at the end. It has either two or three, and, and from the angles, this is an, another study, you can calculate exactly how many of them and the angle of the person who's hitting the Lord. We see here a blood across the dorsal area, which concludes he probably was carried this way because the blood, as a cadaveric blood, flew across the loins in the back. And this would be from carrying him this way, which was matches the history quickly because the next day was a high Sabbath. It was the first day of the unleavened bread. So it suggests wrapping him quickly in order to wrap him, and then that's why on Sunday morning, there was coming to do the correct burial. From the piercing and cutting wound to the chest, first collected under the right elbow, here, it flowed to be under the left one. So it flowed from here to the back, crossing the lumbar region, which is the back of the person. This cadaveric blood shows the movement of the corpse from one side to the other during the burial preparation. This is the, the forensic study. The legs being put on top of one another, you can see here the left one completely covered with blood and the right one is buried with, uh, with it on top of the left, so there's part of the blood on the right one as well. It's the image itself that tells the most compelling story. Everything that we see on the shroud with regard to the injuries that the man sustained are perfectly consistent with what we see in the gospel account. You have a man who was both crucified and scourged. Remember from the biblical story, Pilate did not want to kill Jesus. Therefore, he had him scourged, hoping that that would placate those that were calling for his crucifixion. So now we have a man who is both severely scourged and crucified, which is a very unique anomaly. The figure's agonizing wounds are marked in blood all over the shroud. There is a lot of blood on the shroud. There's a tremendous amount of blood that flowed from the head, a scourging all over the body. There's a blood that flows from the side wound. There's also blood that puddles across the small of the back from that side wound. These stains tell a horrifying story, but they also get in the way of the image. To so the blood here is papers about the analysis of the blood and their dates. Um, and this is the blood that was sampled off the shroud uh, fabric itself as part of the research in May 1950, August 19. And this is all the authors of the paper, 1981. Um, and this is a spectral analysis of what was on the shroud. This is very, very important because one of the attacks on the shroud, this will answer it. Um, it will come later. Um, it's a, it shows that the aloes that were in the shroud and it's perfectly matching what is found in Jerusalem and the wrapping of Christ's body quick, quickly in order to put him in the tomb. So this is the analysis that comes from the spectrometer, the contents of that reveal that it's a human blood. More um, papers that's published about it. Uh, let's get into some exercise that uh, the, uh, one of the researchers did. He took an image of the shroud and did some Photoshop work in order to highlight how much blood was in Christ's body. 
that, that how much he was tortured. And what we did is we exaggerated that. We pumped more yellow into the image and more red into the blood, pulling them apart, just ripping the blood out of the shroud. And wound up with an astonishing image of the amount of blood on the shroud, exceeding my expectations entirely. And I was taken back by how much blood is actually present there. They beat this man to hell. So this graphics artist took an image of the shroud and did some Photoshop on it. He just picked the areas with the blood and said, let me make it more red. And then it amplified the redness of the blood more. Are you getting what's happening here? So it's just a picture. He scanned it, or he took a picture of the shroud. Actually, he took it from Colorado Springs, where the shroud uh, research center is under Jack Jack John Jackson. And he took it and said, I'll choose the areas of blood. I will make it redder because he will take this out and do a 3D model of the whole body, but that's not going to be covered here for the sake of time. This is the polar research and suggests all of the areas that the shout passed by. Dr. Max Fry, he spent five years, five years doing polar research on the shout. And it traces exactly uh, what has been the trace of the, the plants or the, 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 the things that can be caught up in it in all of the areas, Jerusalem, Edessa, Constantinople, uh, uh, Lerie, uh, uh, Chambéry, and then Turin. Let's get to the image, which is the focus that we want to focus on, and defending it. So remember, the first unintended surprise of the French lawyer found about the image showed that the image is a negative. Um, now we're going to go get into another phenomenon of the image that it has no preferred directionality. There is no painting, there is no scorching, there is no burn marks, there is no brush strokes. So up till now, the image is an enigma. Nobody knows what is the image formed of. It's pretty hard to believe that someone could just look at it in the 1300s and say, aha, it's a painted forgery, when we've subjected it to several hundred thousand hours of analysis to today, and we can't come up with the idea that it's a painted forgery. That document has not held up very well, at least not for Pierre Narcisse. Those early caveats were very quickly forgotten, and people went on with the business of accepting it as it was for quite a long while. It would take nearly six centuries to disprove the bishop's assertion. In uh, 1978, a group of scientists were selected to study the shroud. Um, these were not selected by the church. These were selected in the United States. John Jackson of Colorado headed up the effort. And it was multidisciplinary. You had chemists and physicists and all kinds of specialties. We were given five days, round the clock, access to the shroud to study it with then uh, high technology equipment. Well, I came into this being a total skeptic. And, you know, being a photographer, I pulled out my trusty 10X magnifier. I started looking at the image area. And there were no particulates. There was no paint. There was no medium. There was nothing there except slightly darker, discolored surface fibers, just the tops of the fibers. And at that point in time, I knew that whatever this was, it wasn't a painting. Nor is it a drawing, or a photograph, or a scorch mark. So what made the image? After 30 years of intensive analysis, the scientists who examined the shroud still have no idea. They concluded that they really didn't know how the image was formed at all. And that was the really important discovery. And to some extent, this frustrated the scientists because they really wanted some answers.